Hey, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Waterton Glacier Science and History Week 2023. This is our 20th year co-hosting this event. My name is Tara Carolyn, Director of the Crown of the Continent Research Learning Center here at Glacier National Park. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today as we hear the latest results from scientific research and conservation efforts in Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. The world's first transboundary park has long attracted scientists and historians or archaeologists to the park to study both natural and cultural resources found in the Crown of the Continent region. Before we begin, we want to respectfully acknowledge that we are on traditional and ancestral homelands of the Siksagaisatapi, Kootenay, Salish, and Kulispe people, whom we recognize as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. We honor with gratitude the people who have cared for this land throughout the generations and continue to maintain enduring connections to their traditional territories. This is our first of a four-day webinar series. Each day at noon, we'll bring you a new presentation highlighting current research and conservation topics related to Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. Every year, dozens of researchers conduct scientific and historical studies here in the heart of the crown of the continent. And we're excited that this for the fourth year in the virtual format and for the 20th year running, we have the opportunity to share a sampling of results on recent research and historical investigations in the Peace Park with you at your home or office or wherever you might be. This presentation will last about 35 minutes with around five or 10 minutes allotted for questions at the end. Um, some logistical how to use Teams notes. You can click the chat icon to open the chat box where we'll drop instructions for navigating the Teams webinar interface for anyone who's new to this format. If you're using the Teams app, the chat icon is found in the upper right corner of your screen. If you open the Teams in a browser window, um, you need to scroll your mouse across the center of the screen to bring up the menu and select the chat bubble to open the box for more instructions. You may type your questions at any time during the presentation. Um, we'll address those at the end. Note that your questions and comments may be vis visible to all participants. You can also wait to ask your questions at the end of the presentation. We'll address as many as we have time for, and we'll also drop instructions for turning on live captionings and how to expand your presentation view in the chat. Um, today, we are featuring the presentation titled Grasslands in the Crown of the Continent, 20 Years of Change, led by Nico Mariana. He's a PhD candidate at Colorado State University. Welcome, Nico. Nico first fell in love with the ecosystems of Montana during his undergrad work at the University of Montana, where he studied restoration ecology and plant biology. After several years working various botany jobs throughout the West, he dreamed of coming back to Montana to combine his love for ecology and his love for the place. Nico landed a position in Glacier National Park and started his PhD with support from parks vegetation biologist Don LaFleur and a grassland scientist at Colorado State University, whose name I should know. Um, and now in his fourth year of his PhD, he's studying the relationship between grasslands and bison and glacier and beyond, and hopes to continue supporting managers in their stewardship of this landscape. And now I'll turn it over to Nico to take it away. And I will stop sharing and let you share your screen. All right, can you all see that okay? Yes. Perfect. OK, again, let me know how the lag goes with this many folks on here, but welcome. My name is Nico. As Tara said, thanks for coming to this presentation. I'll be presenting on the work I've been doing in the grasslands of Glacier National Park, looking at about 20 years of change in this landscape. So first, I want to acknowledge again that the work that I I'm doing is on the traditional homelands of the Anuskapi Pekani, the Kootenai, the Salish, and the Kalispell people. These 
folks were the original stewards of this land and continue to actively participate in the landscape as leaders in management and local conservation, which I'm happy to present an example of that at the end. OK, so my work takes place on the east side of the divide in Glacier National Park. So hopefully most of you have seen a map of the park, roughly know what it looks like. This is a um, boundary of the park right here, and the Continental Divide kind of splits the park right in the middle. My work takes place in this blue area highlighted on the right side um, towards the east. This is a really fascinating area um, because towards the east outside of the park, the plains extend almost to infinity, just flat um, and dominated by grasslands. And it abruptly meets the, the park where these mountains rise out of the plains and create this dramatic 6,000 foot relief um, out of those plains. And so you, in this kind of the east side of the park, we get the intersection of these alpine environments, these montane uh, ecosystems, as well as this these prairies that um, I've been working in. And so um, it's really a unique and special place. If anyone has been to the park, you you know what I'm talking about. The east side of the park is really, really special. And so the grasslands that I work in are essential for a lot of things. They store tons of carbon and are continually just accumulating carbon and storing it in the soils. They cycle different nutrients that are important for soil building. Um, and with all of this, they provide habitat and food for all sorts of wildlife. If you have seen a bear in Glacier Park, it was likely in one of these grasslands on the east side. That's where it's probably the easiest to see a grizzly kind of foraging in these meadows um, because they rely on these meadows, but also because they're open. Um, and these grasslands are also extremely diverse. So just the grasslands hold 31% or almost a third of the total plant diversity in the park. So um, they're a really neat ecosystem to work in. OK, so where are these grasslands exactly? Or let me just give you an aerial tour. Um, starting up north in the Belly River, this is Google Earth imagery of some of these huge meadows that kind of lie in the valley bottom and extend all the way back. The ranger station is right about here. If you have ever hiked in the Belly River, um, here is the trail roughly uh, going back there. Um, and so, the, yeah, the Belly River contains some incredibly big meadows, that, especially down by the valley floor. Many Glacier as well. You, many of you have surely driven through these meadows on your way in to Many Glacier. That's where we often see bears uh, foraging. But the uh, Windy Flats here, as well as the Apicuni Flats a little bit further back, and the Cracker Flats here on the left are all just um, massive and really important meadows in this ecosystem. St. Mary here holds, this valley holds our biggest, most um, expansive meadows. So right, right closest to you on the screen is the St. Mary Visitor Center with the town of St. Mary right there. And the St. Mary Flats right here is the biggest single meadow in the park that in my opinion, from what I've looked at. Um, it is truly huge. Uh, I have had to walk across the whole thing and it takes way longer than you'd think. So the next time you visit the park and go to the east side, make sure to look because most people I think drive right through and don't quite look at those at this incredible meadow. Um, as you drive up the road from the east side, you'll pass the two dog flats meadows here. It looks like there's you can see four of them. Rising sun is in the background. These are also, um, all of these are really, really large meadows that are utilized by habit, by wildlife all the time. Okay, jumping down to two medicine. Now there aren't quite as many meadows down in the valley floor as in the other valleys. However, up towards the ridges um, below Spot Mountain, which is just north of the entrance station, there are some really, really large meadows that we've spent a lot of time in. And so this is just to show that while I've maybe the larger, more um, obvious meadows are in the valley bottoms, 
Two Medicine is a great example of where really large meadows exist actually up towards the mountains and at the foot of the peaks um, and on the ridges that extend into the plains. Lastly, um, a lot of these, a lot of meadows actually exist on the Highway 2 corridor. And so here's the train tracks and Highway 2 uh, coming up and over Marias Pass. And this area at the southern border of the park also contains quite a few um, really beautiful meadows. Okay, so these meadows are threatened by a few things and woody species has we've known for a while are kind of one of the big threats to the grasslands and meadows in the park. So this is a photo from 1910 uh, off of Swift Current Ridge, which is near Many Glacier. And then the same photo is taken in the year 2000, 90 years later. And you can hardly see the mountains in the background from these trees that have grown in and have obscured the view. So the things like basically anything woody is coming in. Um, here is actually one of our sites that we survey. Uh, this photo was taken in the year 2000, so speed up to recent memory. Um, and in this photo, there's a little white line that you can kind of see. Maybe folks can lean in and see it a little bit. But that same white tape is in this photo in the same exact location. So this photo is also taken in almost the same spot. And obviously, this has been totally taken over by aspen that have come in to this grassland. Um, here is an example of a camp up in uh, Apicuni Falls Trailhead in Many Glacier. And this meadow uh, has a bunch of tents in it. There's a vehicle parked, a couple of vehicles parked inside of it, and of course, people wandering around. So as you can imagine, if you're going to drive into a place and park and set up a camp, you're probably going to do it in a nice open space like the meadows in the park. And so a lot of these, especially these big meadows, have this history of being used, of being trampled um, throughout the history of the park. Here's a photo of that same meadow in the year 2000. Um, and Obviously, no development anymore, but there are these trees that have come in uh, since this photo was taken as well. So kind of to show that there's human disturbance happening alongside the woody species encroachment. Um, one more example to show you. Um, this camp here is in St. Mary Flats, and look at how many RVs are just parked side by side in this campground that uh, was decommissioned soon after this photo and here's the photo of this um, that same area in 2001. No RVs but quite a few more trees. Um, yeah. Okay and so what happens when we bring our vehicles onto these meadows we just drive right over them uh, is that we disturb we, we destroy that native vegetation and introduce some exotic non-native plants like spotted knapweed and so Places like these, this is St. Mary Flats uh, on the left, can start turning into places like on the right side that is pretty much just fully dominated by spotted knapweed. We've lost native species in places like these and the knapweed becomes dominant. And so that's uh, really our biggest concern with the human caused disturbance. Um, part of this story too is that uh, due to the arrival of European colonizers, we removed native grazers from the landscape and replaced them with domestic grazers. And these animals have totally different relationship with the land and the plants there. Um, and it's not nearly as as good for the landscape as you'll see. Um, and, and to this day, there are still uh, domestic grazers in the park, some of them grazing illegally, but some of them totally um, legally as well horses and cattle uh, and what these animals do is that they really promote the expansion of these pasture grasses so kentucky bluegrass and timothy were actually seeded in the park intentionally uh, many decades ago to create pasture for horses and, and cattle um, and they're definitely not 
seeded anymore. However, they continue to expand due to um, grazing by domestic livestock. Okay, and then lastly, climate change, as we know, is very much happening, um, especially in the park. Here's a photo of this very glacier in 1913, and just take a second to soak in that how wide that glacier kind of spread across this basin and now in 2008 how much of that has receded uh, and has melted away and so to show you just a, a figure to illustrate this in the last about 100 years this is 120 years starting about 1900 to 2020 um, the temperature has uh, increased and this relationship is statistically significant um, and it is about one degree Celsius had the, the temperature has increased on average uh, between 1900 and the year 2000. So one degree per century. Um, and this is the specifically the average temperature for the growing season for when the plants are growing June through August. Although this holds true for if you were to do the average temperature for the whole year too. Um, and now kind of a really important part of this is that precipitation, average precipitation during the growing season has not also increased. So it's kind of stayed um, flat. Of course, there's lots of variation, but it's not steadily climbing like the temperature is. So what that means for the plants is that these increasing summer temperatures and the same amount of precip precipitation that they've always gotten means that the soil is drying out and plants um, are likely experiencing heat stress from climate change that they just aren't used to. Okay, so with all of this context, you know, I um, started collecting this data and the goals that I'm going to share with you that I, I'm going to present on are, my goal was to explore the change in the number of native species, woody species abundance and invasive species abundance in the park, see what environmental or human factors that these changes might be associated with and explore ongoing and future efforts to um, do something about what we're seeing. All right, so the work itself. Um, I'm going to tell you today about 90 grassland plots that were established in the park. Um, this is a big area just to illustrate that we're covering lots of big major drainages and it's about 50 miles north to south. These, this is what our plots look like. So five meters on the short end, 20 meters on the long end. And inside of these squares, we look at the diversity and abundance of all the plants in there. Um, these grasslands were surveyed initially in 1999 through 2001, so around the turn of the century. And then in 2018, park botanists started resurveying these grassland plots. Uh, and I was a part of these efforts and still am, really. I just want to note that the initial botanist actually did 155 plots total, um, but I'm only going to talk about the 90 plots that um, me and other botanists made it back to for a second visit to look at that, compare that change um, in recent times. All right, so the number of species found, just a quick comparison. Um, we found 52 more species in the recent survey than were found in the initial survey in those 90 plots. And now that's that's a lot bigger than we expected, and most of those species are native. Um, so at first glance, you might think, oh, like a bunch of uh, new native species are moving into these grasslands, and I'm not quite so hopeful. My thoughts are that the initial botanists, and some of them might be on this call, actually, they can comment, um, is that they, they were using this book published in 1960 as their guide to figure out what all the plants were. Um, the floor of the Pacific Northwest, it covers everything from here to the ocean and um, all the states, several states south of us too, and use a lot of hard words in botany. And so these botanists were kind of wading through this textbook sized guide to try and figure out what all the plants were. 
at the time. And um, it's just really hard. It, it is really hard. We, on the other hand, um, were able to use this book that got published in 2002. Um, Peter Lessica, who's on the call, shout out, uh, published this and other books of Montana flora. And this, this book is just amazing because it's focused on the park, on the plants that we know are here, and it doesn't use a lot of hard words. It's just way easier to use. And so we were able to really um, kind of take our time and figure out a lot of plant species that if we only had this resource, we would have really struggled. So my guess is that we were just able to find a lot more species and identify them that the initial botanists may just not have had the time for. However, you know, just to entertain other possibilities, what if um, species, you know, a common hypothesis with climate change is that species are going to move up in elevation to where it's cooler uh, so that they can escape the kind of drying conditions that are happening and down lower. And so are species moving up to cooler climates? This is a question that I was wondering. Um, and we actually find maybe a little bit of evidence for that. So this is a figure with elevation on the x-axis and the change in species richness, or richness is the number of native species. So any, um, any dots that you see above the red line, above the zero, that is a plot that saw an increase in the number of native species. And there is a uh, significant but very weak trend towards more species being found at higher elevations. So I wouldn't say we can prove anything here, but they're just this maybe suggests that uh, species potentially are maybe moving up or seeking refuge in those higher elevation meadows, kind of like this photo here, the meadows that are towards the ridges. All right, to dive into um, results for some specific plants that are important in this ecosystem, rough fescue is our most common and dominant native grass. It is a just beautiful, luscious grass, as it looks like in this photo. Um, it is uh, stores a ton of carbon every year. It puts down a lot of litter that goes back into the soil, and it's delicious for grazers. Grazers love this plant, and it's our most dominant grass. So it's really kind of a uh, important grass to think about. Um, we found it in 83 of our plots. The first survey, the initial survey, and then um, when we came back, we only found it in 80 of the plots. So. We're seeing a small decline, at least in the 90 plots that we surveyed. Um, Idaho fescue is, an, is our second most dominant plant, and it um, is also incredibly important for wildlife and the ecosystem in general. And it stayed pretty consistent, um, 83 versus 82 plots between surveys. And we think that's because this, Idaho, this grass is um, a lot better suited for disturbances like um, grazers. And domestic grazers coming in. Now, not so cheery is uh, other important grasses in this landscape. Slender wheatgrass here, we found it in 55 plots in the initial survey, but only 36 in this recent survey. So that's a pretty dramatic decline. Um, and back to the woody story, service berry, uh, a shrub that is produces delicious berries. It's great. I love it. But we did find it in 10 more plots going from 40 to 50 plots in um, the recent survey. So woody, all sorts of woody species are increasing, not just trees, not just aspen, but things like service berry as well. OK, so let's dive into woody species a little bit. Um, the median woody species cover in the initial survey was 3.4%. So um, this is woody cover on the bottom, which Essentially, what that means, it's a measure of abundance, is like out of the, the area inside of the plot that I showed you, how much percent cover of that area, how much space do woody plants take up? And so right here is like a plant, is a plot, sorry, that had about 75% of that plot was covered in woody species, right? And so this was the initial survey. 
And now here is the recent survey stacked on top with the median of 13.4% woody cover across all plots. Um, so that's a big jump. That's 10% increase in woody cover across all of the 90 plots that we surveyed. Um, so that's pretty significant. And a common hypothesis with woody cover is that fire um, might be influencing this. So with the arrive arrival of European settlers, fire has been excluded from this landscape. And when it used to be more regular and more commonly a part of, of this landscape, so things would burn more regularly like these grasslands. Um, and the thought behind that is that woody plants really struggle to grow back after being burned, right? Wood takes a long time to grow. And so when shrubs get burned down, um, they struggle to come back. And so grasses and forbs, though, on the other hand, they can kind of bounce right back and um, do well in, in when they are burned, especially frequently. Uh, so that's the thought on why woody plants might be establishing. However, I have some interesting evidence to counter this. So here are four plots that I'm showing you on this map. Here's St. Mary's Lake. And the Red Eagle Fire burned in 2006. So these four plots were surveyed around the year 2000. Then they burned in 2006. And then we surveyed again um, recently in the last couple of years. And all four of these plots actually saw a pretty significant increase in the woody, woody species cover. So almost a 20 or a 15% increase in this middle plot and same with this other plot here. Um, so that's totally confusing. We see more woody species cover um, in these plots that were burned. And here is another example that might elucidate a little bit to this question of why that might be. So right across the St. Mary Lake, the Red Thompson, Red Thompson, the Thompson Creek fire burned um, on the north side of St. Mary's Lake. And we had a few plots in this burn too. Uh, it burned in 2015. And um, some really interesting results happened here where one plot, this plot furthest to the left here, saw a dramatic drop in its woody cover from 75% woody cover all the way down to about 5% cover. And then literally the plot right next to it, they're super close on the map right here, the next plot saw an increase from about 40% to 85% woody cover. Now that is really bizarre seeing that these two plots are right next to each other. And um, thankfully, because I go and actually look at these places, um, I think I can know why. And that is because this first plot on the very far left, you could actually see the remains of the uh, up here, the common shrub is bearberry or kniknik. Um, you can see the remains of these shrubs that had been burned in this fire. Um, however, in the second one, those those remains, uh, essentially the, the shrubs were still intact. And this is a, a low growing shrub um, that stays really close to the ground and it did not burn at, in this second plot. So basically, what we've learned is that you know fire doesn't burn the same across the landscape uh, the intensity matters so even though the trees in the area might be burnt it doesn't necessarily mean that the grasses and the sort of low-lying shrubs burned as well and this is a perfect example of that where one plot did burn totally through and this other plot did not and the shrubs remained intact so fired is doesn't necessarily solve, I guess, our woody problem issue. Another idea that has been tossed around that is that if things, if woody plants burn, especially things like aspen, that aspen forest might burn down, but it'll re-sprout really, um, really thick and become, and can even become more dominant after a fire if it isn't potentially grazed by things like bison and elk that could go in and actually keep down those those baby new aspen growths um, and 
leading to maintaining that grassland. So uh, I think that you need a specific kind of uh, low intensity grass fires paired with grazing by native grazers in order to actually keep those woody species um, from encroaching. All right, let's talk about invasive species for a minute. Um, in our grasslands, through all the surveys, we found 32 invasive species compared to uh, the total number of invasive species found in the park is about 127. So that's good. We don't have all of the invaders in our grasslands. However, it doesn't look good when we look at the number of plots that have invasive species. So 78 out of the 90 plots in the initial survey had invasive species already. So this is around the year 2000. Um, most of our plots already had invasive species in them. And uh, in the recent survey, three, three plots that didn't have invasives the first time, three new plots did have invaders so invasives are already um, pretty much widespread and still kind of establishing themselves and so species specific um we're going to start with this timothy this pasture grass which was found in 67 plots initially but that has expanded now to 74 of our plots had timothy in it uh kentucky bluegrass was found in 57 of the initial plots but we found it in 62. So both of these pasture grasses are increasing. Um, they're more widespread. And again, this is likely caused by um, domestic grazing that's still occurring. Um, dandelion also increased significantly from 52 plots that we found it in to 60 plots. And this, this one spreads not only by grazing, but by disturbances like the one that I'm showing on the right. Um, and most alarming, unfortunately, of all is that we found knapweed in 16 plots originally, and it more than doubled the plots that we found it into 35. So let me just rephrase that and say that we found knapweed in more than twice as many plots as we did 20 years ago. So that is not great news for these grasslands. Um, to kind of show the abundance, a little bit of abundance comparison, the median invasive species cover was 2% in the initial survey, uh, and that jumped up to 7.3% with the recent survey. So the abundance of invasive species is increasing across the plots that we found. Um, and then, you know, a common um, hypothesis with invasive species is that, oh, they you know, they they are more common where human disturbance happens. So roads and buildings, that tends to be where we find weeds. And that's usually true. However, I went and tested this and see to see if there was a relationship. So I mapped whether the change in invasive cover, so whether weeds are increasing or decreasing in our plots, uh, with the distance to roads on the x-axis, I also tried trails, I tried roads and trails combined, and there really was no, no relationship, no obvious relationship um, with the distance to human caused disturbance. And really, um, the reason that is, I think, is that there uh, are a lot of historic disturbances, such as um, horse and cattle trails, as well as old camps and old chalets, that we're actually sometimes a ways from ex the roads and trails that exist today. So this is a photo of uh, 1920 of Causley Lake. And Causley Lake is about eight or nine miles up the Belly River drainage from a road. So it's pretty far up there. And there used to be all these little camps set up with a hitch rail and probably tons of horse use in this little meadow way up there. And so, um, that camp is gone now, it's not there anymore, um, but that disturbance legacy lives on. The other part of this story is that Glacier Park actually has one of the most incredible um, native plant restoration programs in the park service. And so every year there are tons of folks out there near the roads, especially spraying weeds. 
And so in some places, this actually, we probably detected the fact that a lot of the weeds are sprayed, especially near the roads. And so some plots near the road might not have had as many weeds as they maybe once did, or as maybe some of the locations that are harder to get to uh, might have as well. So both of these things combined maybe explain that pattern where we find we are finding weeds next to the roads, but also way far back in places we wouldn't expect. Okay, so quick conclusions on this data that I just presented to you. So woody and invasive species are increasing. We know that, that's what we detected. And then fire and the proximity to disturbance alone, these factors that we often assume are explaining these things, they don't, they don't explain these things alone. There's more to the story. Um, the number of native species might be increasing at higher elevations, but we aren't totally positive on that. Um, and domestic grazers continue to promote invasives uh, throughout our plots. And as I mentioned, at one point, fire and native grazers together, they need to be used together to reduce the woody species encroachment that we're seeing. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water for the next part. So, as many of you might know, or many of you might not, on June 26th of this summer, the Blackfeet Nation, which is adjacent to Glacier Park, released free roaming wild bison back to the landscape. Bison lived here historically, but they have been, they were removed completely about 150 years ago. So this happened this year, and it is absolutely so incredibly exciting. Um, oral histories of from the Blackfeet Nation and other tribal nations in the area, as well as archaeological evidence found in the park, prove that bison were all over the east side, not just in the valley bottoms, but actually up in the alpine basins and maybe even on some of the summits. Uh, they have found archaeological evidence all over the east side of this park from bison. I want to present to you some recent results found in the uh, tall grass prairie in Kansas, where they had bison grazing, and that's the red line here with a ungrazed control area in gray at the bottom, and then cattle grazing in blue here. And this is a time span of 30 years. And on the y axis is the number of native species. And so over this 30 year time span, bison increased the native species richness or the number of native species to 103% above the ungrazed control, which is essentially twice as many native species. So where bison were grazing had twice as many native species after 30 years from the ungrazed control. Furthermore, that increase in the number of species was 62% more than the influence of cattle in that same landscape. This is to point out that bison and cattle are very different in their effect on the landscape. And even more importantly, right here in this kind of yellow, this yellow highlighted area, this area experienced a, um, this tall grass prairie experienced an extreme drought for two, two summers where it got very little rain. And while the species richness dropped a little bit in that time frame, it bounced right back after that drought had finished. And so these effects of bison on the ecosystem there, on the total diversity, was resilient to drought, which drought is something we just expect more and more of with climate change. So this is to show you the, just how much promise this has, that we introduce this native species um, 
that the Blackfeet introduced this native species back to the landscape. So um, here's kind of a map to show you some uh, recent collaborative work with the Blackfeet related to grasslands that we're doing. Uh, here's the Blackfeet Nation, which is the entire east side of the park. And right, this star is kind of the location where these bison were released. Um, they were released into what's called the Chief Mountain Allotments. And this is 26,000 acres of tribal lands that were recently set aside for graze, set aside and grazing was retired from these lands. And so this is a pretty big area. It's 11 and a half miles from the bottom of the top and six and a half miles wide. Um, and like I just said, cattle grazing, it used to be grazed really heavily by cattle, but the cattle were retired for uh, basically for the bison and for conservation in general. Um, this area has some really stunning and significant grasslands and are really critical bison habitat. Um, and just this year, working with folks at the Blackfeet Community College, that's what BCC stands for, we were able to establish 20 new vegetation plots, the same kind that I've been talking about within this within these allotments. And that's uh, just really, really exciting that through me, the park is supporting the Blackfeet Nation in monitoring and surveying and just figuring out what's going on with their grasslands. And so here's some photos of uh, the interns we were working with from the community college, as well as other helpers and um, the surveying that we did in these meadows that are on the Blackfeet Nation. So this is this just happened this year. It's really, really exciting and we hope to continue. Um, this monitoring is part of a bigger kind of uh, idea, this bigger project that the park is embarking on to support the Blackfeet Nation in a larger native plant program where um, the Blackfeet Community College is interested in getting a greenhouse and so they can go collect native plant species, their seed, go bring them to their greenhouse, and um, one day maybe start actually planting native plant species back out on the landscape to help support it. So this goes hand in hand with the monitoring that uh, we did um, just to, to essentially try and understand what's happening and improve the landscape overall. OK, so to wrap up, we have climate change. We have altered historic disturbances such as fire, um, development from humans and domestic cattle grazing. All of these things are kind of influencing these grasslands and shifting them towards non-native dominated uh, uh, grasslands. We're losing our native diversity. Um, so what can we do? We need to restore historic disturbances like fire. We need to support active restoration programs like the one that exists already, um, but keep supporting it and expand it. We need to introduce, or not introduce, but restore native grazers, native disturbances like bison um, and support that. And then we have to really restrict and limit our development um, because once, Essentially, once a place has been disturbed by humans, it just it never quite comes back. And that's very evident in what we see. So this is an opportunity for us all here to ask, can we tip the scale back? And maybe we can't completely scale things back to what they were, but at least we can try. All right. So. I want to thank a few people out there who have really helped me out so much. Don LaFleur, the park vegetation biologist, was the first person to kind of say that she um, believed in me and gave me the chance to do this. So I just want to say a massive thanks to Don. Uh, Dr. Melinda Smith is my advisor at Colorado State University. Uh, all the other technicians and botanists that I worked with, Marissa, Keegan, 
Jen Guzzi, who taught me everything I know about plants, Allison Dubnezik, Heidi, Ezekiel, still smoking, and Justine Tromley, who those last two were uh, Blackfeet Community College interns that helped a lot this summer. Um, collaborators at the Blackfeet Nation, including Alicia Yellow Owl, as well as the um, Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife Program, and also these various funding sources, the NSF, National Science Foundation, the program I'm in, which is a graduate degree program in ecology, and the Glacier Park Conservancy that funded pretty much all my work. So big thanks to them. And then I want to do one quick shout out to the first botany crew that did that first survey around the year 2000. Jen Acebrook, Dave Shea, Sue Olin, Tara Carolyn, our host, was a part of this, uh, an instrumental part, actually, uh, Jack Potter as well. And so this is their uh, final report published in 2010. It can be found online if you want more information, um, but we wouldn't be here without them. Great, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thanks for that really interesting presentation, Nico. And of course, since I was involved 20 years ago, I was really interested in seeing your results there. Um, if audience members have questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll go through those and um, or you, Nico, and or you can use the hand raise icon to and I if you want to just ask your question, um, I will call on you. Um, but to start out, you've got some tricky questions have come in, Nico. Um, Wendy asks, what would have been the dominant forbs on the grasslands prairie potholes en route to browning prior to modern agriculture? I suppose assuming it's similar to in the park or. And of course you have involved in some there. Prairie potholes, so I'm assuming you're talking about where water gathers ephemerally uh, in these kind of depressions in the grasslands uh, and what what might grow there. Um, you know, I think we have uh, in our grasslands, sometimes our grasslands are in wetter sites, sometimes they're in drier, and I would assume that they just have some of the more wetter species, including um, there's a good handful of sedges that we only find in those uh, wetter potholes. And from what I've read, those sedges are actually really important for grazers. Okay, and Zach asks, he's noting that some very interesting trend plots. He says, where did your temperature and precipitation data come from? Was it weather stations within the park or were they external or modeled? So they were modeled there. That was that came from PRISM data uh, that essentially models uh, climate history across the entire, I think, continent. Um, but I that was specific to this uh, St. Mary, the town of St. Mary, the pixel that I use where there is a weather station. So uh, in theory, that that data is directly informed by the weather station within that within that pixel. Yeah, and their group has come out with some really neat additional data accessibility. Let's see, Pam asked, is the presence or absence of beaver affecting woody plant establishment? Good question. I mean, it surely, surely is uh, where we find beavers. Um, they love the aspen. Um, I've yet to find a plot where there were aspen in there that have been munched down directly in one of my plots, um, but it's certainly happening. That's absolutely true, and I would be really interested to uh, quantify that. I will note that you saw our plots. There are these rectangles that were placed kind of usually more centrally located inside of a meadow. And that woody encroachment is really happening along the edges, right? It's like those aspen groves are sending their shoots into the grasslands. Um, things are getting established around the edges. And that's probably where you would see that beaver effect as well as where the aspen isn't too thick yet. And there's young shoots and that's where the beaver might spend time in. Um, and so we don't capture that with our data. Uh, it's an outstanding question that needs a 
uh, remote sensing approach really to see how that from the edges of those meadows, how are those how are those edges changing? Um, let's see. And we've got Wendy is will, wants to volunteer to help with the BCC project in some way. Wendy, if you send us an email at crownrlc at nps.gov, we can probably get you connected with the right people to learn more about any possible opportunities there, I would say. That's good. Yeah. Um, Monica asked, what is the plan to prevent overgrazing and manage bison numbers? That's a good question. Um, I think we're uh, oh, quite a ways out from having an overgrazing issue. At this moment, there are 19 bison out on the landscape, so really not that many, although there are plans to introduce more. Um, um, yeah, I am not involved maybe yet with the management part of the bison in the park side, uh, so I, I can't quite answer that. Okay, I am going to sneak in a question a little related to that. Were you able to discern in the plots that you looked at about how many of them may have been affected by recent grazing, whether horse or cattle trespass? Um, it's, we weren't, um, well, unfortunately I didn't present this data yet, uh, cause I'm still working through it, but in the last few years, so not the entire resurvey period, but just the last few years, we started surveying for scat. What kind of scat do we find around these plots? And so, um, this data will allow us to, to say, oh, well, there's, cattle scat or elk scat or horse scat in the area. And so we can say yes or no, it was grazed or not. That um, we don't have that for all of these plots. Um, and it, this wasn't done in the initial survey, uh, but I don't have an answer for you yet, but we'll hopefully, when I defend my dissertation, you can tune in and hopefully hear some of my answers. Yeah, I hope to do that. Um, let's see, we're getting quite a few questions. I'm going to skip this longer one for a minute and maybe come back to that. Um, great stuff. Oh, let's see, who's this? Renata. Great stuff, Nico. So interesting. Can you talk about some of the physical mechanisms that take invasive species into areas where they weren't previously? Yeah, and so, um, Specifically with our pasture grasses, we think that um, especially horses are potentially spreading their seed. Um, horses are not a ruminant, and so they um, don't quite digest vegetation as well as a cow or a bison. Cows and bison are ruminants, which means they have four stomachs and are really good at just breaking down everything that um, they consume. And so, uh, unfortunately, I think that the horses are consuming not just the plant, but the seeds of some of these pasture grasses and a lot of these other uh, invaders. And um, that seed can go right through their gut and pop out on the other side somewhere else. And we don't know for sure that bison won't do this as well, but we certainly expect that it'll be a lot less. Um, another thing too is that uh, talking with folks on the Blackfeet Reservation where they, they have uh, bison herds in pastures uh, already, they're, they're, they're enclosed, they're not wild, but they're um, cultural herds. They don't see a ton of certain invaders like knapweed in that landscape. And we actually saw that bison we're eating knapweed before it was flowering, which is great. Um, and so who knows, maybe bison, if, if they're in the right place, they'll they'll eat knapweed before it's flowering and keep and be able to fight that back. We don't know, but we're hopeful. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna be able to get to quite all of the questions. We'll do a couple more, um, but we will, might send some of these questions to you 
to Nico to address by email afterward if, if there's time. Um, let's see, Rocket asks, has there been any impact on population of ground nesting birds from domestic graders, grazers? Great question. Uh, Lisa Bate, the um, one of the biologists for the park has been resurveying the birds. I have yet to connect with her and kind of see what those results are, but um, that is another follow up question. One last. There's a lot of good questions in here. I'm feeling bad leaving some out. Um, Here's Vlad asks, is there evidence that bison grazing has effects specific to invasives? Um, so actually in the that study that I showed you in the tall grass prairie where that uh, species richness or that total number of native species had dramatically increased over 30 years, the, the weed species, the weedy species had not increased um, and they're abundance also had not increased. Um, it had kind of remained stable at a low state. So that is a different system. It's a tall grass prairie, but it does give us hope that um, bison may be a tool for um, reducing invasives. We can only hope. Okay, and I think I'm going to wrap it up there. We are almost at the top of the hour. Um, right. So thanks everyone for the great questions. Um, thanks again to Nico for and all of our planning and tech team working behind the scenes. And of course, thank you for all, everyone who's joined us today. And be sure to join us tomorrow at noon for a, a really fascinating presentation. Termaine Edmo, it will also be talking. Um, she's a climate change coordinator for Blackfeet Nation will be telling us more about the EE initiative, um, cultural adaptations to the Blackfeet Buffalo program. So I'm really excited for that one. We're interested in your feedback on the webinar, including any, how, if the audio and video quality worked fine or any other comments you might have, please feel free to share those or additional questions with us at crownrlc at nps.gov, which should be going in the chat there. And thanks everyone and have a great day.